Will you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The parable of the prodigal son is a challenge to preach not because there's so little to say, but because there is so much. Where do we even begin to address all that is happening in this rich and challenging story, and why shall I even preach anything after Mukin's beautiful solo? <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I believe that this story, perhaps Jesus' most famous, is one of his most spiritually and emotionally powerful. Just the thought of such extravagant mercy and unconditional forgiveness brings us to our knees. I also believe that this story touches us so deeply because we see ourselves in it. At one time or another, we have been the lost and desperate younger brother, wasting the gifts and the opportunity or the love that's been given to us. At another, perhaps we've been the self-righteous older brother, resentful, keeping count, holding a grudge, refusing to let somebody back in our life because they've hurt us. We call this passage a story, but it's really much more than that. It's a parable, Jesus' favorite way of making a point. Now, a parable is a sneaky kind of story. It invites us in by setting up a familiar scene and then turns the whole thing upside down. When speaking of Jesus in this church, we often use the word subversive. And Jesus was a subversive. And his parables underscore that. They are not fables with clear morals. They are paradoxical and multi-leveled. They are invitations to challenge our conventional thinking. Parables are also more than fables because we, in our humanness, are not really the focus. God is. Parables tell us something about God's rules, God's priorities, about what it would feel like to live in God's country. Now, one of my favorite words to use, which I know can really irritate some of you, is the word kingdom. <laughs> when talking about that countercultural realm of God, I use the word kingdom instead of kingdom, and it's not because the G doesn't work on my keyboard. A kingdom is a place where power is wielded from above, where the layers of hierarchy separate the bottom from the top. A kingdom, however, describes a place where relationships are measured by love and care, where people see each other as brothers and sisters, not as subjects. A kingdom is a family. And I think it's clear that biblical vocabulary issues aside, that is the kind of place that Jesus is talking about, especially in this story. So getting back to the story, let's take a moment to better understand what is going on. For as is so often the case, we look at these texts through 21st century lenses which tend to blur the important first century details. Understanding Jesus' world matters. As a writer once said, the past really is another country. So it helps us to know the lay of the land. To begin with, Jesus tells this story as part of a series of parables to help the crowd understand what the kingdom of God is like. And he's overheard by the Pharisees, the legal scholars of the law. The Pharisees were faithful men. They were good men. But they saw the world primarily through the lens of the commandments. And it was their job to make sure that everyone else did too. Rules matter to the Pharisees, and Jesus broke them all the time, especially when he ate with people that the law said were unacceptable, the sinners, the outcasts, the losers. It was so scandalous. It was so undignified, so subversive. Jesus is just so irritating the way he loves people. So as the Pharisees are getting on Jesus' case about breaking the rules, he tells them this story. And this is a story that challenges human rules, 
especially with regard to fathers and sons and inheritances. But it's about more than money. It's also about relationship. This is not just a story about a spoiled, impatient son who wants to get his trust fund early. See, in first century Palestine, wealth was held in estates, namely in farmland. Land was where your security was, both in its inherent value, but also in what it would yield you in crops. Families would depend on the annual harvest to feed themselves and provide an income. To demand that his father sell his land and give him the money, the younger son was seriously crippling his family's future and security. By cashing in the proceeds and wasting them, the son was basically abandoning his responsibility to his parents in their old age. And of course, the only way the tradition allowed a son to inherit was when the father was dead. So the son is not just demanding his money, he's basically telling his father to drop dead. I cannot imagine a more stinging or heartbreaking rejection than that. Yet despite his son's callousness and against all common sense and convention, the father agrees to sell part of his land. The son takes the money and he hottails it across state lines and like a wild teenager with a credit card, he basically parties it away. He goes on a sex, drug, and rock and roll bender. And when all is spent, he wakes up by the side of the road hungry and broke and most likely seriously hungover. Desperate and afraid, he takes the only job he can get, slopping the pigs for some farmer, which was a pretty rough job for a good kosher Jewish boy. After a couple of days of wishing he could eat what the pigs have, he hits bottom. He starts to think about home, and he remembers how well his father's servants were treated. He wishes he could live even half as well as they do. He swallows his pride, what's left of it. He gathers up his courage and he starts the long journey home, dreading the encounter with his dad, hoping that at least he'd be given a job and maybe a bed in a barn. But facing his father is not his only concern. For in first century Palestine, there's a steep price for returning home in shame. This was a communal society. His actions would be condemned by the entire town and his family would be smeared by association. The outraged people would greet him with a gasasa ceremony, where they would smash jars around him and declare him cut off from the village. There would be no welcome home banner for him. But his father has another kind of homecoming in mind. Seeing his son still far off, the father begins running down the road. Now this is a man's of, man of means a respectable, dignified man. But here he is, hiking up his robes, sandals flying, racing toward his son. First century fathers were not like this. First century fathers, like all patriarchs, ran the household with authority and rules. You broke the rules, you paid the price. They loved their children, but it was love tempered by custom and tradition. Fathers did not run to their children. But this one does. He's not thinking about that wasted money. He's not thinking about his own reputation. All he's thinking about is what it's going to feel like to have his son in his arms again. Any parent of teenagers knows what it feels like to be so angry and hurt by a child and so desperate to lay, to lay eyes on him at the same time. Knowing that if he ever walks through that door, you will give him the moon even if he doesn't deserve it, even if it may not teach him the right lesson. We know what it is to be so frustrated with your child's behavior you could throttle her, yet rush to her defense when anyone else utters a negative word about her. As a parent of teenagers, I'm right there with that father, running down the road, tripping over my robes, gathering up that dirty, smelly, hungry boy in my arms and simply uttering, Thank you, thank you, thank you. And this, Jesus says, is how God runs to us. This is how God welcomes us home, even after we have wasted all we are given. This is how God embraces us, 
even after we have rejected her love and told her, in essence, to drop dead. What kind of parent does that? What kind of God does that? It can be hard for us to wrap our hearts and minds around. It's mercy beyond measure. It's scandalous. It's undignified. It's subversive. Our litigious, grudge-holding, bean-counting world doesn't cotton to this. Even our religions tend to focus on the idea of judgment and punishment more readily than forgiveness and grace. But this story says just the opposite. It tells us there is nothing we can do, no distance we can stray, no depth we can fall to that will cut us off from God's love and forgiveness. In just about every Bible translation, this story is called the prodigal son, focusing us on the extravagantly wasteful and reckless boy. But I believe that the character that is most central for Jesus is the father, the one who stands in for God, for this is a story about a foolish God, a reckless God, a wasteful God who squanders his extravagant love and mercy on the likes of us. A God who cares not for what the neighbors think or even if we deserve it. This is a God who is so outrageously in love with us that there is no limit to her joy when we finally come home. This is a prodigal God. When have you broken the rules and thought you'd blown it? When have you turned your back on love and never dreamed you could get it back? Or when have you found yourself resentful and begrudging when someone else has been forgiven or restored after all they had broken all the rules? When have you been stuck in scarcity thinking, convinced that love should only be doled out to those who have earned it? These questions can haunt our personal lives, but they can find echoes in our public lives as well. When we think about how we live our values in a community, when we use terms like makers and takers, when we decide who among us is worthy in the inclusion of the American dream and who is not, we are a practical people, a justice-seeking people, and we see justice as a legal contract Break the law and you lose your chance. We tend to make room only for those who have earned it, but not for those we blame for their own desperate circumstances. They made the red, they burned their bridge. Let them pay the price, we say. They didn't get here by the rules and we don't owe them anything. And common sense agrees with us. Practicality agrees with us. We can't go around forgiving people's debts or excusing them from punishment. That's not fair. We can't make room for just anyone who wants to join us. We won't have enough to go around. It's not good for business, and it's not how the world works. Very true. It is not good for business, and it is not how the world works. But it is how the kingdom of God works. And that is what Jesus is trying to tell us. Is this good news? It might depend on which brother you identify with. But to Jesus' radically loving, unconditionally forgiving, and downright subversive good news means that we are not subjects of the kingdom of Caesar, but children of the kingdom of God. And no matter who we are, or what we have done, or where we have been, God is waiting for us to return. As soon as God sees us, coming over the crest of that hill, off he goes, robes hiked up, sandals flying, tears in her eyes, and a goofy smile a mile wide, waiting to catch us up in her arms, ready to love and forgive us, ready to welcome us home. The feast is all ready. The party has started. We can almost smell the barbecue. And all we expected was to sleep in the barn. It's mercy beyond measure. It's scandalous. It's undignified. It's subversive. And it's ours. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>